Hello and welcome to another episode of Advanced GIS Analysis and Programming. And on today's episode, we are going to be looking at an introduction to programming. You can find the lecture slides on our course website down in the lecture links. All right, so introduction to programming. The real question here is what is programming for GIS? And let's go back for a second and look to see how we define GIS. You probably recognize these images that are often used to describe a GIS, but what is it? So the two common visualizations here, the left is a pincushion of possible applications, and on the right is that separation of the real world into individual layers, representing perhaps a category or a theme. Okay, well, still, how do we define GIS? Well, some argue that GIS is all about maps. You know, maps, 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 maps. And if it's on a map or could be represented on a map, then it has to do with a GIS. Others point out that GIS helps us understand spatial relationships of everything around us. This is an idea supported by quantum physics and entanglement theory, and certainly we can analyze different metrics of spatial relationships. Are two things coincident? Are they separate? Are they randomly distributed? Do we see clustering? But what I find that I like best is the simple simile that relates GIS to the kind of machinery transforming data into information. So data are our measurements of the world around us. And they could be on a map, they could be tables of numbers, and they could be just an image of the Earth from space. As an aside, please note and differentiate that data, which are our measurements of the world, are not the same as products, which are the outputs of our analyses and can sometimes look like data. All right, so if we think of GIS as a machinery, uh, and a machine performs some set of given tasks that take an input like raw material or data and deliver an output like a product. Machines can be generalized as a type of tool so what are tools and why do we have them? My father-in-law says there are no hard jobs if you have the right tool. And the images here I'm showing you represent snippets of the history of adding devices from the hand-operated abacus to the mechanized odner to the contemporary electronic calculator app. We generally learn how to add at a young age and if adding is a simple task, why the evolution of these devices? Well, if adding is a simple task, let's do a quick example. Can we add the first two numbers in a sequence? Zero plus one. Quick, what's the answer? It's one. Right. All right, well then what about the first three numbers? You know, and if you quickly add them in your mind, you get three. What about the first five numbers? Oh, I tricked you. I skipped four. Quickly, what's the answer? Ten. All right. The first ten numbers. Quick, what's the answer? Starting to slow down a bit now, aren't you? It's 45. The first 25 numbers? What's the answer? Quick? Hmm. It's 300. Now, those of you uh, math majors may recognize that this is equivalent to one-half n times the quantity n plus one. Yes. Uh, so you could solve each of these sequences in about the same amount of time. But the idea here is simplifying long tasks into shorter tasks is the kind of mechanization of the adding machine. Uh, and recognizing that there's repetition of simple tasks has led to automation, just a push of a button in today's case, or a touch screen. So what does this have to do with GIS and programming? 
All right, well, let's look at a different example, one that's more ingrained in GIS. This is the concept of distance. And there are several types of distances we could calculate. So the first being Euclidean. This is our straight line distance. Next being rectilinear, also known as the Manhattan distance or the shortest distance cars drive between two intersections. And then geodesic. This is the shortest distance along the surface of a sphere. So distance is one of those intrinsic qualities in GIS. This whole idea about what is near us or how far away is something. So let's take a look at this map. Let's say that there's someone located at that plus sign right there in the middle. So uh, let's say points A through E are locations of interest. Uh, they can be you know, a gas station, an ATM, a Starbucks, whatever. So let's say your job is to tell the person located in the middle which is the closest to them. All right, real quick, which one's the closest? Now you could get out a ruler and you could measure each one and say, okay, I think it's probably A or B, and it turns out it's B. Now, real quick, order them from closest to farthest away. This might take you a little bit longer, but you certainly could measure them all out using some kind of measuring device. All right. Now, what if I imposed a grid? This is like Manhattan distance. So we see this uh, a lot now with GPS navigation devices, the first GPS back in 1998, the first smartphone with GPS back in 2005, and by 2014, every smartphone had a GPS and completely changed the world of navigation. Distance calculations here change slightly. Now A and B are both the same distance away from that plus sign. And notably, D and E are also the same distance away. Now, what happens if we imposed road closures? What if the plus sign started to move? What if it continuously moved? You'd have to recalculate distances over and over again. All right. Now imagine that these locations are on a global scale. You're now looking at geodesic distances something like airplane travel between countries. What if all the people in the world operating the estimated 2 billion GPS units in circulation are all asking the same question? What's closest to me? How far away is that? What's the shortest distance there? What we see is that a relatively simple task like distance calculation can be made difficult based on scale, the number of requests coming in, and time, how quickly it needs to be done. And this is just one of countless examples where automation is critical. So going back, we said GIS is a tool to help us solve spatial questions. Looking again at applications, we see that most of these have issues concerning scale and time. And to address this challenge, it requires us to have yet another tool, one that can handle a lot of requests in a short amount of time. This is where we come to the world of computer programming. So back to this whole idea about there being no hard jobs if you have the right tool. You can think of writing computer code like building a machine that does the heavy lifting for you. Yes, it's going to take skill to design and build a well-made machine. But once you do, the rewards are unparalleled. Computer programs come in a variety of languages. Needless to say, there are a lot to choose from. For GIS and increasingly in data science, thanks to the developments of numerical and scientific libraries, Python has become a good choice. Why Python? Well, first it's considered a high-level language, and that means that it's easier, as a result, generally faster for us to read and write. This tends to make development quicker and simpler. Secondly, it's object-oriented, which has several advantages over structured or functional programming by simplifying the process of creating programs through the use of specially designed 
classes of objects. And these objects can encapsulate a specific set of rules, values, and functions that can easily be maintained, reused, shared, and scaled. Third, in addition to the standard library, there's a plethora of well-documented and supported third-party packages to help support a variety of projects. Namely, the industry standard GIS software company Esri and ArcGIS and the world-leading open-source desktop GIS software QGIS both provide Python support. Python is actually two things. It's a language and it's an interpreter. We need to know how to read and write in Python. That's using the language. But we also need something that can understand what we just wrote, and that's the interpreter. The idea that computer programs are a language means that we need to get two things straight semantics and syntax. So what do either of these words actually mean? All right, so if we think of syntax, uh, we have this set of symbols and rules. If we're going to create a new language, what's the first thing you think we need? It's probably an alphabet. And an alphabet can be those symbols. And then you can think of the rules as the grammar and mechanics of the language. So you have an alphabet that is used to form words, words that are combined with proper punctuation to form sentences, and then sentences that combine to form paragraphs, and so forth. Okay, so what are semantics? Well, semantics is the prescribed meaning to the word. The same goes for statements and programming terms. If I spelled out H-E-L-L-O, or if I said hello to you, uh, you get the sense that I'm greeting you. And that's the meaning behind those words. We also know that the general greeting hello can be spoken in other languages, like ni hao, or guten tag, or bonjour, or shalom, or hola, or ciao. The same semantics i.e. the same meaning, but in different syntax. So does that make sense? In my experience, a lot of programming begins with you knowing what is the intent. In other words, I want to add all of these numbers together. It's your job as the programmer to figure out the proper syntax to accomplish the task. And here, just as an aside, know that there are pros and cons to using different programming languages. There is not one perfect language for everything. Some are more catered to uh, or are popular with certain fields. So Fortran is still popular in atmospheric science. R is still popular for biology. MATLAB and engineering, Java and Flash for web applications, C Sharp, C++, and Lua for creating video games. All right, so how about some examples? In the first example, Python doesn't actually speak, but it writes out the word hello. Here we see the first example of what's called a function. A function typically performs just one process or a procedure. In this case, the print uh, prints whatever is given to it. And if you're familiar with spreadsheets like Microsoft Excel, you probably already know about functions. They have a name, and they take values inside parentheses. The quotes here just tell the function to know that we want it to print the characters H-E-L-L-O. In the second example, we see two functions, sum and range. Let's start with the inside range function. We give this function a value to start and a value to end before. So in this example, it'll give us values 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Note it doesn't give you 5. So here we send these five values to a function called sum. 
which is like the name suggests, adds all of the numbers up that are given to it. And we already saw earlier on in the addition example, the, the sum of the first five numbers is 10. And in the third example, we see the first introduced concept of packages and modules. These are more commonly referred to as libraries as they define new functions and provide additional capabilities. Here, the very first one is the import statement. It is a keyword for Python to look up and load a what could be considered a quote-unquote expansion pack to the standard library. So this adds functionality to your code. The output here shows the directory of the user's home folder, os.path.expandUser. So this is a function in the path module of the OS library. The fourth example here, we see uh, how to access the major number of our Python version. It's probably good to mention that the Python community is currently still split between those who stay with Python 2 and those who have moved on to Python 3. Uh, Python 3 has some fundamental differences in syntax and semantics that many uh, who have already developed for years and years in Python 2 were more or less frustrated with the idea of having to go back and update all of their code. Hence, we still have both of them available. Uh, for GIS, ArcGIS, QGIS, uh, the current versions all use Python 3. And if you're new to Python, I highly suggest you use Python 3. All right. In our ArcGIS online group, I have posted two notebooks, Exercise 1, Python Fundamentals, and Exercise 2, More Fundamentals, to start to walk you through the, these semantics and syntax of Python in GIS. And I also have provided these additional readings to get you a better sense of what is Python and how it applies to GIS. All right, please take a look at the examples, try them. You can make your own copies, just put your initials in the file name, ask questions in our issues tracker, and good luck programming. I'll see you next time.